So it's 6 p.m. on Monday evening, and the three of us are in the national capital region. Rini and Papa CJ in New Delhi, and I'm, I'm in Gurgaon, the village close to New Delhi. For those of you who have joined in now, welcome. Thanks for spending a part of your Monday evening with us. This is the fifth of a series of episodes we're putting together called Zero Hour Online to bring interesting people to share stories of inspiration, thoughts on inspiration to everybody who's listening in now. <coughs> also going to be on the Reputation Today YouTube channel in the future, and one can watch them at leisure later as well. Today we have two very interesting people, and we have two interesting people every week, but these are more interesting than the ones we've had in the past, and you'll know why in the next 15 minutes. For those of you who grew up in the 80s and 90s watching Doordarshan, Rini Kanna is a name and a voice I'm sure all of you have heard in some form or the other. You also heard her narrating the Republic Day Parade in the past. You hear her on most of the metro rails in India. I hear her voice in the Delhi metro as well. Papa CJ is the man who took Indian comedy international. He's an MBA from Oxford, but he gave up a corporate career 15 years ago to become a full-time stand-up comedian. Today, he won't do stand-up comedy here. He'll just talk about other things beyond comedy and, and things that many of you may want to ask him. So welcome, Rini, and welcome, Papa CJ. Thanks for joining us on Zero Hour Online. Thank you, Amit, for having us. Thanks, Hi. Amit. The Thanks, Amit, Amit for today. considering us. Thanks, Amit, for considering us not worthy to be in your first four sessions. And when you ran out of people, you called us. Thank you. Absolutely. I didn't think of you until the fourth session. By the fourth, fifth session, I was not sure whom to call. And I said, okay, these two people sitting in Delhi have no shows going on right now. I'll get them to do something exactly. with me on Monday evening. And that's Thank all you. we began. Thank you. Thanks. I'm grateful. Thank so you. I have a new Nehru jacket from Fab India, just for the two of you. Thank you. <laughs> Amit is the only person who wears a jacket in 40 degrees temperature. That's outside, you know, for I have my at 22 degrees, so I have... The show cold. is called Zero Hour, so in, in, in you know, respect of that uh, Zero Hour of Parliament, he's decided to wear a jacket. You know, someone's already asked a question, but it's actually a hi. Rini Chatterjee says hi, Rini and Papa CJ on the Q&A box, which is nice of her. We'll come to her a little later. Hi, Rini, we know your presence has been made effective to all of us here. I'll straight away jump into this and go with the same flow we've done with others in the past. Um, for those of you who haven't read Papa CJ's book, Naked, a lot of the book has stuff around his childhood and growing up years. Rini hasn't written a book yet, and I'm going to ask her about that later, when she plans to write her book, and you can get to know of her childhood there, maybe. So I'll start by asking Rini first. Amit, Rini Amit, 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 can you just clarify at the top? You said for those of you who haven't read Papa CJ's book, Naked, the book is called Naked. It's not that they have to read it while they're naked. Correct. But you, they can do it both ways. You can read the Naked book by being naked as well. I read it when I was... <laughs> naked <my> book. <laughs> okay. Cool. So for those who have just come in now to the show, we have about 40 people on, about 75 to 80 registered. Welcome once again to Zero Hour Online. We have two interesting people uh, on the show with me, talking in general. I'll ask Rini, tell us about how your growing up years, where, where did you grow up in? We know you're a, you were an army kid. So tell us about cities you lived in and the schools you went to. Wow. Um, okay. Um, I was born in Delhi, but I moved around. And um, since my father was in the Air Force, actually, we moved to, I think we did five cities. Um, so Delhi, Bombay, a uh, place called Bardogra, Halwara, and uh, Tambaram, which is near Chennai. These are the cities that I've been in, but I went to about nine schools across these uh, five cities. Um, <clears throat> childhood has been just like any other army kid, I guess. Uh, you live, you've lived in cantonments, you've lived in campuses, uh, you've also lived outside of the campus. <clears throat> and um, pretty much had to make do with whatever was available. Um, so you've, you've had schools that were in barracks and schools that are air conditioned and schools that are public schools. So you've, you've, you've done the entire you know, uh, gamut as it were. Um, the idea of uh, you know, schooling is very different when you're an uh, uh, army kid because you, you get to make friends with people who you've never seen or heard of before. Uh, you get to eat lunch boxes that are uh, completely different from what is served at home. 
Um, so you're introduced to a lot of new things. And I think that's the exciting part about being uh, an army child. Um, and also, I think having been to five cities, you get to learn uh, languages which are different from your own. So I've learned uh, Bengali, I learned Marathi, I learned Tamil, I learned Punjabi. Uh, Hindi and English you do learn in school. <clears throat> and uh, you get to um, either you know, continue learning those languages or at least getting to understand um, communication from, from people who live in those areas. So a highlight of your growing up was, was multiple languages, multiple cities, multiple schools. I'll come back to you on something I want to ask in a moment or two, but let's hear it from Papa CJ. I've read it, I know, but for the ones watching it now and in the future, tell us about your growing up years, the schools you went to and how it was like. So I grew up in, uh, my father worked in the tea industry. He worked for, for one tea company for 35 years. So I initially grew up in Calcutta. And uh, if you want to know what Calcutta was like in the early 1980s, you can go there tomorrow. Because as we all know, time stands still in Calcutta. But I went to a boarding school for nine years uh, called the Lauren School Sanar in Himachal. And just like Rini, we had uh, people from many different cities across India who were there. And we didn't learn the languages, but we learned to abuse in every single language. Uh, so we would get by. So the person we were talking to would understand that it is important. And uh, I mean, I can go on for hours on stories from school. If you want, I can tell you one. I mean, basically, there was a standard rule in school that uh, you sh if you get caught doing some mischief, you will get a beating. So either you learn not to get caught or you just don't, you know, uh, do stuff. You don't break rules or you learn how to take the beating, which a lot of us did. And I, when I say beating, I mean beating. We got, we got smacked with hockey sticks on our bums until we had that Nike sign that swoosh on the backside for a week. You, you literally couldn't sit. But we were mischievous kids. I remember, I remember once we had an, an English teacher called Mr. Sibyl. And we used to call him Zap because he was quite a spaced out sort of fellow. One day, he took his wife to Chandigarh for a dental appointment. While he was away, these four Sardar boys broke into his house, stole a CD, ate all his food and ran away feeling very happy that they have gotten away with it. Mr. Sibyl comes back from Chandigarh very upset, of course, that his house has been burgled. But it turns out that he wasn't as spaced out as we thought he was. Because the next Monday, he was an, an English teacher, right? He set an essay writing competition. The title of the essay was The Mystery of the Robbery at Mr. Sibyl's House. All these four thirds wrote exactly the same story, right? And the, And... Of course, they got caught and they got a hammering. They just changed the name thing. You know, they went in through the ventilator. They stole a Brian Adams CD, like that specific. And I asked one of these guys later, I said, Sadi, why did you write the truth? He said, brother, I thought we'll get full marks. So that's <laughs> one of the stories from school. I think I read that story in your book and it's, it's very funny. Yes, I have. So I'm going to come back to both of you on this. So when did you realize, uh, I, I know in CJ's case, you changed career paths after getting into the corporate world. But for Rini, when did you realize that you had a voice that could kind of enthrall the audiences across the length and breadth of the country? When did that occur to you and when did you get into Doordarshan? Tell us about that story. Oh, um, well, pretty much very early in life because um, I had a father who was very keen that uh, I should speak English the right way. And so uh, from the selection of schools, he ensured. Um, and, you know, uh, being, being a child who was, who was traveling every two years, uh, packing up bags and moving to a new school, um, he was very, very particular that every station that we went to, he ensured that I got into a good convent school and I was not a KV student. Uh, I was a KV student for a very, very short period of my life when I couldn't get a convent uh, school to go to. And so because I went to a convent school, he ensured that I had uh, access to good uh, pronunciation, good language, um, and, and you know was able to, to learn English well. Uh, having said that, these schools then gave me the opportunity to do a lot of, um, you know, performances, whether it was declamation, elocution, debates, uh, 
uh, and so on and so forth. So um, very early I was being groomed as it were. Um, we also had a family friend in Neeti um, who, uh, whose husband was in the Air Force. And so um, she was somebody who, who, who the family kind of adored. And I grew up literally listening to her and watching her on screen. Um, so in my mind, I was very clear that I wanted to be something like Neeti. Uh, and I, I definitely wanted to be on television. So um, I think by the time I was in my 10th or 11th, I was back in Delhi after having toured all these four cities. I came back to Delhi and uh, won the Shankar's International uh, Competition for, for Speech. Um, got spotted by the uh, INB minister, the then INB minister, Vasan Sate, who died, uh, who put me onto radio and said, uh, in fact, called somebody who was who was covering the event and said, um, "Can you know she's wasting her time? She should, she needs to get onto radio very quickly." Uh, and I was in school at that time, so eleventh, maybe my eleventh standard. Um, so I got called, went to Yugovani, um, did a couple of stints of recording stuff on my own. Um, doing a program uh, and then uh, by and by as I was doing stuff in school uh, it was a natural progression but I was very clear very very clear that I wanted to be on television that was my uh, goalpost as it were um, having been uh, in the Air Force school in Delhi at that time on the 11th uh, in my 11th I was also asked to do the Air Force Day parades which were parades that were done every year uh, on the 8th of October, and the Prime Minister was the chief guest. So the first Air Force Day parade that I did, uh, I had Air Chief Marshal Latif, uh, who was the chief at that time. And after he had heard me, he requested that I should be brought down to be introduced to the Prime Minister. He was not told that I was a child in school. He was just told that this is a voice from radio and that you know she's, uh, she's a broadcaster. So I was standing in my school uniform waiting to be introduced to uh, Mrs. Gandhi at that time. And uh, uh, Chief Marshal Latif stands there waiting for a long time and we're wondering what's happening, why isn't he you know, kind of introducing us? And till somebody, uh, this is a girl in big Across her teeth and you know the spectacle, and she can't be possibly the voice that I heard. So each program that I did led me to closer and closer to uh, my post, which was uh, uh, got on to uh, All India Radio for news. And I was put on uh, the, the national news at that time. Um, and 82 uh, Asian Games, that was the Asian Games when I got onto uh, radio. And uh, when I applied for television a year later, I was told that no, you had to be a graduate and you could not get onto uh, television news. So 84 is when I uh, debuted on uh, Budashan and, um, and then continued for okay guys so it looks like the host has been thrown off this <laughs> this this whole scene so should we jump into the uh to the audience q a until he comes back i think there was a question there uh i don't know there are some questions already can you okay, see the so questions Rini, yeah Rini, i'm going to throw the question at you uh firstly sure. there is another there's another girl online called Rini who was named after you so how does it feel to have somebody, uh, people naming their children after you? Yeah, that's a little, uh, it's a little uncomfortable, um, you know, truthfully. Um, when, you, when you meet somebody who's called by your own name. Uh -huh. um, but it's interesting. It's really interesting because I get to meet a lot of people, a lot of people. And uh, this includes, you know, not just the ones who've been named after me, but also their parents. Uh -huh. who tell me that they've been watching and they, um, they've been watching me and, you know, hoping that their child picks up um, 
community. Uh, yeah. after. But you know, it's interesting, uh, CJ. I didn't get my name just like that. Go on then. Um, I had a reaction to a vaccine, and oh. um, it's one in a it's one in a million that that survived that um, that particular situation. And so uh -huh. I was declared dead as a baby. Um, okay. And my father refused to believe that. And so yeah. whacked me on that table for a while to okay. revive me. Okay. And when I came okay. back to is when they decided, yeah. well, I already had a brother by then who was six years older to me. Uh, his name yeah. was Ronnie. And they okay. wanted something that uh, matched him. Yeah. Uh, however, they were still undecided about naming me. So uh -huh. when they had went through this process of being, you know, the child being declared dead and saying, um, my father struggled with that and said, no, I can't accept this. And she's, yeah. she's, she has to be back here. So they uh -huh. selected the name Rini, which means reborn, Rene. Okay. Uh, okay. And, and that's how the name came about. A lot of the people I, who've I, been named after me don't know that story. I think you have also proven what... Uh all Indian parents know, which is that if you want your child to be one in a million, you have to basically whack them on the head. Yeah. <laughs> you know, luckily, I'll never be. <laughs> yeah. Luckily, I will never be in the same situation as you, because I can't think of a single father who's going to name his child Papa. It would be really weird. <laughs> Both of you calling each other Papa. <laughs> yeah. 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 That, 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 no. But um, I think you've got a unique name as well. And I think... Uh, I think it's it starts. No, with, no, 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 no. Uh, nice, nice, nice try. Nice try. We're not talking about me. We're going to focus on you today, okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. You, we, but we you need this to tell people how your name came about too. Oh, no, no, we'll come. They can read that in the book. This is about you. So we've got questions from the audience. I'm going to go to the first one. The first one is from K. S. Narahari. He said, "If you are, if wow. you are offered, he he says, if you are offered an anchor's role today." in one of the private English news channels, will you accept it or not? And why? So Narhari, basically I've been offered uh, many jobs as it were uh, with uh, television networks, but really I, I have, uh, I mean, if you look back at my career, then I haven't joined anybody. I've remained independent from the start, uh, except my stint with Doordarshan, which again is not as an employee. And the reason for that was that uh, in my time, I think it was it was really um, not the usual path. Everybody wanted a job and wanted security. I was not looking for a job. I was looking at trying to do as much as I can in the little time that I had. Um, so no, I, do, I would not take up a job because then that would restrict me to one channel and one company, which is not what I wanted to do. Today I can, I can pick and choose who I want to work with and um, and actually work with whoever I want. By the way, this also explains why I'm single. Huh? <laughs> so, so CJ, I'm going to come back to you with the question I asked Rini earlier. I hope Rini yeah, asked that question when I was away. How did go you on. decide? How did you decide to move from the corporate world? You went to the UK, did your MBA at Oxford. What made yeah. you decide that you should quit your corporate career and get into stand-up comedy full-time and become a comedian to earn a living? Well, for starters, I hadn't seen stand-up comedy until three months before I started doing it. And uh, my dad being a tea planter, we, we, weren't, uh, we weren't exactly a cash-rich family. right? So I grew up in the kind of house where, where shampoo never finished. It just magically became thinner over time. Uh, so I had taken a big loan to do my MBA at Oxford. I worked for three years in a consulting firm. I paid those loans back. And then I took a sabbatical for a year. And in that year, I went to the Edinburgh Festival and I saw these guys doing stand-up comedy for the first time. And I thought it was the most amazing thing ever. I mean, here's a guy on stage with a drink in one hand and a microphone in the other, and he's just having fun and that's his job. I thought it was the most amazing thing in the world. Uh, and actually, the truth is that uh, when I started doing stand-up, I was debating between doing stand-up comedy and taking a bartending course. But that bartending course that I looked at, they only taught us how to mix the drinks. They didn't teach us how to juggle the glasses. Right? Now, Rini, really, let me ask the you. bar on that completely. No, sir. Rini, really, let me ask you. Do you think it's cool when they juggle the glasses? 
Rini, do you think it's cool? So long as you don't spill my drink, it's fine. Exactly. Now, I thought if I can't juggle the glasses, I'm never going to get laid, right? I mean, that's why I got into stand-up comedy, and that was 15 years ago. And in the last 15 years, I can't tell you how many times. Wow. How many so, times I wish I had taken that bartending so, course? <laughs> <laughs> have you moved from Have you moved from the juggling the glasses to drinking from the bottles straight now? Well, with my life, yeah, I should be opening a brewery at this point. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you both you both seem to be super jovial people. I've known both of you for about two and two three years only, not longer. And I've every time come across you to be very jovial, and I'm sure you are jovial most of the time. And there are your low moments. Tell us how the last three months that the whole world has faced. have been for y'all given that all the things you do regularly have taken a, a little bit of a backbench or a standstill of sorts how have you dealt with the last 3 months given your many years of doing things that you did in a fun way i think cg should take that first okay okay uh, so i have found that respect for stand up comedians has gone up during the lockdown uh, for me especially with like all my friends and family because for 15 years my family has been saying you know cg you just sit on your ass all day and do nothing at all and during the lockdown they have discovered how difficult it is to actually sit at home and do nothing all day so from that point of view it's good but the other thing that has happened which is very strange outside of the fact that i see two amit prabhus on screen right yeah. now yeah why do we because see he's on amits? from his laptop on his I'm coming back ah okay a, okay yeah uh, the other thing that has happened is that i have found myself i mean i've been doing some online shows and i have been disgusted with myself for how much i have enjoyed it because all my life i have gone around telling the whole world that stand up comedy is like sex it's best enjoyed live not in front of a screen so if you're watching it on a screen it's like surfing comedy porn but i have thoroughly enjoyed being a porn star because i get 25 people on my screen on the laptop uh i they their sound is on their video is on i can see who's sitting with whom they become like my front row so it's an interactive gig i can customize it i can personalize it and it's bloody awesome but i have to say this i uh, i miss the travel i love the whole uh, i've been doing this for a long time but i still like staying in a nice hotel which somebody else is paying for there's nothing quite like you know picking up the phone and saying i want you know and whatever comes after that they're supposed to get you uh, so i miss that whole experience and also 2 or 3 years ago i made a resolution that i would i will spend more time with people who i care about people who matter to me That's so right. whenever i so so whenever i travel anywhere for a show i always take an extra day or two out and i will go meet a friend meet a family member i'll stay with somebody i'll have lunch or dinner or coffee uh, so that is something i miss because i believe there is no real substitute for human interaction and meeting people live and sharing that energy in space rini on to you yeah i think i echo um cj's thoughts on that um the 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 one thing that i miss if i do miss anything at all is that human interaction uh, beyond your family beyond the people who are staying with you um i think i miss that the most having said that um both cj and i have i mean probably cj has been more busy than i have Uh, I've been relatively busy, but not so busy. But it's also given me time while being at home uh, to be able to spend time with uh, people who matter in my life uh, and things that matter in my life. So you know, whether it is gardening or whether it is looking after your family, cooking, uh, doing all the things that you want to do uh, and you never had the time to, uh, all that has kind of you know put things in. Um, in place for me uh the other thing that i i have really missed a lot is um one to one conversations one on one conversations which which for me is very important although i've been a television person uh for me uh you know my my career has taken me across television radio um you know to being faceless to being um to being just a voice over you know, the metros or telephones uh, or films that i have watched so um taken me through that journey and put me at a space where i've been on stage and have had audience a live audience in front 
to, which, to whom you have kind of, you know, had a rapport and you've built up a relationship. And that is what I miss the most. You can do a, you can do a thousand Zoom calls, but it's never the same having people, real people in front of you and having that reaction and, you know, uh, interaction. So, so yeah, that's the big, big thing that I miss. I just want to point out, Rini, it's, uh, it's very frustrating having your voice in so many places as well. Yeah, because true. there are times when I've there are times where I've called some somewhere to complain. I've called, say, American Express to complain about something on my card, and I just want to shout. And I just want to shout at them. And then suddenly it's your voice that comes saying, "Welcome to American Express." I said, "Oh, it's Rini. How can I shout?" <laughs> <laughs> true, that's true. So I've had played that, strange played, reactions to my voice. Yeah, so they I, played that one well. I'm going to jump in back here, Rini. You, I mentioned this is the beginning of this conversation that you haven't written a book, and I think. There is a scope for you to write a book on the life you have led by being the voice of several things in several ways. Did you did it ever strike you in the last three months that this is the time to start writing a book, or is book never an idea that has come to you or occurred to you in the past? Oh, a book has uh, occurred to me many years ago, and I had started writing, and there are there are many chapters that have been written up to now. But uh, um, these are chapters which are you know, or rather, these are stories that are um, backstage stories which. Really, I don't know whether I want to share with the people as yet, uh, and and the and Ooh. the environment being what it is today. Oh yes, you wanna. I I don't know. I don't know. CJ CJ will probably have a lot of fun reading it, but um, <laughs> it's 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 a lot of private moments and a lot of off stage offline uh, encounters, which really reveal a lot of things about people. Um, and and uh, as you know, I mean, I've done a lot of. Um, important programs and important personalities yeah. that, you, that you encounter and you get to see in a different light. Absolutely. So, so well, um, yes, the book is being written, but I don't know whether I want to publish Well, Rini, if you're yet. doing a book for starters, it should be an audio book. I think that should come first. Good idea. Yeah, maybe. I still remember being a witness two years ago when the Will Smith episode on stage happened. Ah, um, it can be done as an audio. On WhatsApp. So each time I WhatsApp you, I see that I remember what happened at the HT Summit with Will Smith. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, that's the, that's the nice thing about uh, being an anchor on stage live. CJ, can you hear Rini? Are we losing nope. her? She's gone. Yeah. I think her reception is patchy. That's okay. Rini, we can't hear you. We'll come back to you. You can either salvage the situation or you can. No, she... Yeah, all we heard was salvage the situation, which was quite appropriate. <laughs> so that. No, we can't hear you. When we hear you, we'll, we'll come back to you. CJ, you've written a book in the last few months and I saw you somewhere mentioned that you're planning a second book now. Are you yeah. able to share with us what the second book is all about or you want to keep it under wraps? No, I'm happy to share it. So in fact, I've written, uh, I'd say a third of it and uh, already during the lockdown. And I'm still trying to figure out. So I have, I have been interviewing a whole bunch of people. So uh, people who I consider to be... Uh, sort of high achievers in their fields. And I want it to be the kind of book that will inspire others. So I've uh, interviewed uh, Kiran Mazumdar Shaw, Deepa Malik. Uh, I already have an interview for, uh, with Irfan Khan on file, which is just fabulous. Uh, he, it's a very deeply insightful interview about his thoughts on many things from religion to death, to the profession, to children and parenting. And uh, Essentially, there are two or three things that I want readers to take away from this book. The first one is that no matter how successful you are, at some point you have had a really crappy time in life, right? You've had challenges thrown, thrown at you. And whether or not you have succeeded in dealing with those challenges, uh, you have learned from them. So not only do they share anecdotes and the learning from it, but uh, the lesson for the readers is that you can learn from yours as well. Uh, the second thing is, you know, as a kid growing up, I had a lot of role models. But as I grew older, these role models started to disappear. And I asked myself, why has this happened? And I think the reason it happened was because I started meeting some of them as well. 
and I discovered that every human being was flawed. But then it occurred to me that that's perfectly fine. You know, every human being is flawed. So you don't need to be perfect. You can still be the hero of your own story, even if you're not perfect. And I think the last one is the most important one, which is that of the many people I have spoken to, each one of them is so different in terms of what has influenced them, the things that matter to them, how they would like to be remembered. So the big lesson from that is that there is no right way. You know, you can only be a second best Rini, Rini Khanna, but you can be the very best Amit Prabhu on the planet. I mean, in your case, maybe not, but uh, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding, of course. Uh, but uh, the, the idea is be authentic, be yourself and carve your own path. So learn from the others, but, uh, you know, carve your own journey. So that's, that's what I want my reader to take away in terms of how I actually present the book. I'm still trying to get my head around that. I think once I write out all the interviews and the patterns will emerge. Uh, so yeah, that's the headlines of that. So there's a question from Giri Shuria for both of you. They want to know who do you each of you admire in your profession? They want to know, Rini, who is the news anchor of current times that you admire if there is one at all? If there is none, you can say that. And to CJ, the question that Girish has for you is, who is the one comedian that you admire the most currently? So Rini can go first and then CJ. Um, in the Indian context, I think Barkha, she stands out uh, for, um, I mean, maybe not all her work, but uh, certainly for the time being. Um, the past, I think, uh, three months or four months that she's been on the road, it's, it's just amazing. Um, her track record, her perseverance, her, um, her commitment to getting the news across and um, doing it, you know, impartially and not being uh, swayed by the, by the political situation. Thanks. And CJ, other than yourself, who is your most favorite comedian? No, I'm definitely not my favorite comedian. Uh, so for me, a lot of my comedy heroes are people who I have seen perform live. You know, I'm not a big fan of, uh, I still don't enjoy, I don't, I, I watch almost no stand up uh, on TV or online. But there are rooms where I have gone. So I did 700 gigs in my first three years on the UK comedy circuit. There are shows where I have gone on stage. I have struggled to get the audience to laugh. And so suddenly somebody has come on stage and absolutely destroyed that room. So for me to see somebody work that craft, and there are different people I admire for different things. Uh, there's Adam Hills from Australia. You leave his show always feeling warm and fuzzy. There's always a percentage of proceeds that goes towards some charity. Uh, Stephen K. Amos is very good for his just charisma. It's just crowd work. Andrew Maxwell is one of the most well-read comedians that I know. You know, so a lot of my comedy heroes, I admire them for different bits. But more than anything else, I think I've been a little bit, uh, jaded is not the right word, but off late, I have not been enjoyed enjoying comedy as much in India because somehow comedy, people, people seem to think in India that comedians are celebrities, you know? Mm. Every show that I do in India is a corporate show with a you know high profile audience, the sea level audience, or it's a theater solo show with you know 600 people in the room. What I miss is the club circuit, you know. I miss four comics getting on stage, doing 20 minutes each, and just playing and have having fun. For me, stand up comedy is still it's a hobby, it's a passion. I love it. It's play, you know. The the profession part of it is actually a byproduct, you know. I don't like the fact that people actually take comedians so seriously in our country, right? Sure, you can choose to have an opinion on things, but we don't need... A lot of people think comedians are very intelligent people and knowing you and not how to flatter you, you are an intelligent person. So when you're intelligent, people think that, hey, these people are intelligent. No, no, no. Listen, we can, we can do no, a bit no, of no, social... But, no, but let me, just, let me just throw in this element. I mean, a lot of uh, the comic... Uh, the comedy that we are seeing today is is um, a lot of roasting as well. So I don't know whether whether it's you know it's just a show where you go and have fun. Um, I'm 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 a little concerned about people uh, actually burning you. Yeah. Uh, you know, for you to for you to become famous. 
so i i i have a i have a very specific uh, thought on this which is so both of you have seen me perform live i do a lot of audience interaction i have no problem teasing people mm-hmm. i have no problem embarrassing them i never want to be hurtful yeah. right i don't want a single person w- walking out thinking i i felt hurt you know and often what happens so when stand up when english language comedy stand up came to india you had a lot of these guys from the comedy store in the uk who would come to the club in bombay and do this crowd work and a lot of young comics who were watching them basically started thinking that abusing people is yeah. comedy yeah. because they didn't realize that the comics they were watching had been doing this for 20 years so they didn't understand the nuances behind it they could only see what was on the surface they couldn't see the energy exchange you know and with a roast what happens i'm not a huge fan of roasts i mean i enjoy watching them uh, because what is actually said is actually quite mean in terms of what is said about people and i'm not a huge fan of yeah but you know, i mean you know the kind of stuff that are, is said are indian audiences receptive to the intelligence or the the punning that takes place or the satire that is being you know put out there oh i can give you a i can give you a two hour thing on so here's my here's my i'll give you a shortcut on uh, my perception of audiences so america is uh, is is the fast food of it's mcdonalds here's a joke here's a joke here's a joke here's a joke in many cases on the west coast like la stand up comedy is a means to an end i'm going to do a 7 minute set i'll get noticed i'll get a development deal i'll get my own sitcom in england it's like fine dining it's part of the culture you know you can tell a 3 minute story and the audience will have the patience to wait for it if there is a good punch run at the end in southeast asia audiences are very polite you know so you've got to be in their faces you do crowd interaction you like that was funny clap you know then they you know in india english language stand up is slightly different in that all over the world it's a very grassroots art form anti establishment anti elite in india english language stand up comedy is performed for the elite so by and large your audience uh, may be a little bit better traveled better educated now the other thing that happens is we are a huge country all over the world over the course of time audiences evolve and so do comedians and it's the audience that puts that pressure on the comedian saying okay dude we we heard that kind of stuff before you need to get better in india the audiences are so huge that the second an audience evolves somebody else comes and takes their place so the comedian doesn't necessarily feel that pressure to evolve that being said the beauty is we are such a large country that there is space for any kind of comedian you know and it's great to see the the boom in regional stand up comedy you know so no matter who you are there is an audience for you you just have to love what you do and you know and do it really so thanks for that i'm going to come back to the last 3 months of our lives what have you all done different in the last 3 months given that things were not working the same way they were prior to march 22nd uh, i know you both said you've been busy and i know cj has done a few shows online corporate and otherwise rini must have been doing some recordings and voice overs what have you really done that you felt you couldn't do in the prior to march 22nd live because things were so crazy busy and now you got that time what are what are the things you've done in the last 3 months to do Should I take that first? Yes. Please. Okay, so um I've had the experience now of hosting a webinar which I never 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 thought it would happen. Um but yeah, doing a live event, I've done a launch, I've done I've done a couple of launches actually and I've done a trans uh, Atlantic and trans Pacific um a webinar for for the united nations so that was a huge learning a big learning because we we were working with different kinds of teams and timelines and um you know zones uh so ensuring that uh, everybody was uh, <clears throat> tuned in and 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 debating a particular topic that was interesting i've done also a lot of recordings at home which i never thought i would do uh, especially for uh, audio books um so that's interesting so yeah um kind of different from from the kind of work that i would have normally done um right. i i still don't enjoy doing things at home i would rather be uh, mm-hmm. in a studio or be in a in an auditorium 
Right. Sita, my question is something I'm picking up from Durgesh Garg in the Q&A box. He wants to know from one of you, what do you do to keep yourself motivated during these times? Especially you, CJ, you love traveling, you love meeting people, staying in those hotels, and that's not happening now. How do you keep yourself motivated? So here's the thing, right? I mean, I, I remember reading this wonderful thing that it's a pandemic. It's not a productivity contest, right? So I think it's very important from a mental health point of view also to know that it is absolutely okay to not be motivated. It is absolutely okay to say, you know what, I'm struggling with this. You know, for me, there were distinct phases. I started off this pandemic thinking of it as a productivity contest. You know, I'm going to work out. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. There's a, I mean, there were 10 things I was doing every day. And after four days, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to sit on my backside and watch Netflix. And that's fine as well. And I think over the course of time, you figure out what balance works for you. So uh, my response to Durgesh would be that, and also I think as for people like Rini and myself, uh, you know, there is a different pattern when you live the kind of lifestyle we do, the kind of jobs we're in. We don't necessarily need to, we don't do a 95, 95. You don't have to be motivated every day. With any creative profession, there will be some phases in which you'll just be in the zone, you'll be super productive. And there are some phases where nothing is coming to you. And initially, when you get into this profession, you, you struggle with that. But then you realize, you know what, this is how it works. So you learn to go, go with the flow and just chill. Say, you know what, I'm not motivated. It's downtime. But one of the things I will say is that two things really help me. If you are struggling, talk to your friends, you know, especially, your, chi especially your childhood friends, right? Because they connect you with who you really are. You know, it's a great sense uh, of grounding. The other thing I find is, and, and the second part of that is when you talk to other people, you will find that a lot of other people are struggling as well. And when you share that struggle, you're both able to feel better. The other thing that I find helps me a lot when I'm feeling down, if you can uplift somebody else and make them feel better about something that they're struggling with, you're automatically feeling better yourself. But yeah, the, the most important thing I would tell Durgesh about this, you don't have to be motivated. It is perfectly fine. I mean, this is not an everyday situation. It's once in a century, you know. You yeah, but having be, having yeah. said that, I don't think I don't think I don't, I don't think it's just okay to just not be motivated also and that you completely go into you slip into a you know a phase where you're depressed and you're not talking to anybody. Um, that communication channel has to be left open. Whatever you're doing, you may not have you may not have targets. You may not say that okay, I've got you know ten things to finish and I've got tasks to do, um, and that you've got time you know deadlines that you need to address. Uh, however, you need to have somebody to talk to. So yes. so keep, keep those channels open and develop a friend circle. I think it's very important to have a core group that you uh, touch base with. Maybe not every day, but at least once a week, um, and ensure that you know everybody's holding up everybody else's spirits. Right. No, thanks for that. Can I just jump in on that? Uh, just to add to exactly what Rini said, you know, like people have a gym partner or somebody they go to the gym with to exercise. I think it's very important, like you have a partner for your physical health, to have a partner for your mental health. Even if it's just a friend who you say, you know what, once a week, uh, we're just going to check in on each other, right? Somebody you're comfortable being vulnerable in front of without feeling judged. And it may not have it happen immediately, but as you, as you keep going on sharing, you will be able to open up a bit more and know that you're not being judged. So I think that's very important. Interesting. Yeah, I, I just want to add uh, Amit to this, you know, and because of the pandemic, a lot of us are stuck in places. Um, I have my uh, brother and his family who, who live in Italy and uh, who actually went through the Corona. So um, I think having that communication channel open to be able to talk to every day, um, we, we are you know, separated as far as geography goes, but at least we could call each other up and say, hey, how are you feeling? And how's it happening today? And you know, did you have fever or, or whatever? Check on each other. Um, uh, having said that, I have my parents who live in Noida and I'm not physically able to go and check on them. So at least you have you know, a call, a video call that takes place. You talk to each other every day. So like he said, you, know, you have to have a buddy system. You have to have that 
uh, that chain that links you and gives you meaning and gives you some sort of motivation to pull yourself out of bed and say, okay, I've got things to do. I mean, this is bang on. This is exactly the answer one was looking for conversations for a better tomorrow. A lot of people don't realize that it's okay not to be okay. A lot of people don't realize that this is not a productivity contest, but a situation that we are all faced with. And I think these answers coming are helping people. I'm getting messages saying, wow, bang on, thanks. Rini, do you do any specific exercises or practices to keep your vocal cords in good condition? No, or- I do all the things that I'm not supposed to do. I drink cold water. I... Um- I don't gargle with salt and all that stuff. I, I don't do anything. Uh, but what I have you, is what, what, what I've been given by God, and that's the end of the story. But yeah, I'm, I'm sure I'm sure you need to do um, you know you need you need to do things like look after yourself. That's all. Um, you can't do stupid things like you know um, eat the wrong kind of foods and um, drink all day and and expect to have a you know a good health. Good. Sita, do you have a rule for yourself before, or ritual for yourself before you go on to a, a live show or live audience or you just go with the flow? Uh, for starters, uh, I don't believe in rules. Uh, they're just guidelines. Uh, but no, I, I don't have any rule. The only thing is that uh, I always remember that I'm there for them. Uh, so they just need to leave the room feeling happier than they did when they walked in. Do you, do you drink lots of hot water and stuff like that before you go to keep your throat going uh, like that? No. That's no. Markesh's question. His question was, is there any exercise practice to keep your vocal cords in good condition? And both of you uh, thrive on your vocal cords and make people completely go excited but, with your voices. Well, yeah. But I must say this, that uh, Rini and I are not the best examples. If you are a professional voice user, uh, yeah. then yes, yeah. you should look after you your should. voice. You, you should. should do the, you know... Uh, but then Rini and I don't really follow the should stuff. So Right. So some, there's some question from a person with initials AS. I don't know who that is. To Papa CJ, what are some of the things to bear in mind before switching from a stable career to following your passion? So here's... <laughs> uh, just be prepared for poverty. <laughs> right? It's a marathon and it's not a sprint. So here's the thing. Uh, you love what you do. You get good at it. And then the money comes. That gap between loving it and the money coming is indefinite and it may never come. So you need to be able to last out that phase. But also I think there's a, there's an evolution that you go through as an artist or a performer. And it's very important for you to find your own voice. I mean, if you want, I can, uh, I can give you an example of how it works in comedy. So in comedy, for example, when we start initially, you want the confidence that you can make people laugh. So you'll go for the easy joke. So the kind of joke I would do is, uh, uh, is, you know, as somebody who lives in, in Delhi, I don't understand the language they speak in Bombay. You know, we call it bread, they call it pow. We call it piaz, they call it kanda. We call it a servant quarter, they call it a 2BHK. So both of you have heard this joke, easy joke, you'll get the laugh. Then, of course, observational comedy we keep doing. Then we do political comedy or we will use bad language. We'll pick on people on positions of authority. Because we want to be seen as edgy. We want to be seen as cool, right? But you guys will know this, you know, after you've heard a young comic get on stage and use BC three times, you're like, okay, dude, I've I've got that. Now where's the joke? But eventually, I think what we are really lucky about is that I've always said that stand-up comedy or any art form for that matter is an outward expression of an inward journey. We are lucky to operate in a profession that has no rules, no boundaries, no guidelines, So you've got to ask yourself, what are the things that matter to me? What do I want to talk about? And eventually you don't even care about the audience. Your audience will find you. The people who don't like you will weed themselves out automatically. So you need to be true to your voice, no matter who is in the room. And I think that is a journey you have to be prepared to traverse when you're following your passion. But it takes a long time. Uh, And uh, you've got to remember that passion is great, but it doesn't put food on the table. You've got to feed the stomach as well as the soul. So maybe have some kind of a side gig. Sorry, that's a long answer. Rini, you want to add to that? No, I was, I was basically wanted to talk about the fact that, you know, the key word is passion. And uh, very often when you're passionate about your art and your craft, uh, you're not looking at money as the final goal. You're looking at a lot of other stuff, which is actually satisfying you. So, you know, coming back to the first question that was asked to me, why I don't have a job, And that's one of the reasons, because I did not want to get tied down. This was something that I was, you know, 
completely committed to me. And even if it meant that I'm not earning as much as, you know, a Barkha is or a Arnab is, it didn't really matter to me. What mattered to me was that I have an audience and I'm communicating and people are receiving me well and I'm doing my best. That's all that, that you know, pushes you. So um, if, if, your, if your aim is how, much, how many dollars do I earn at the end of the day, then you're not, you're not in the right profession. Then. I mean, you, then, then there's something else that is you know, kind of pushing you. So uh, you, know, you can't take up your passion and say that, okay, I'm going to you know, make millions out of it. That's not what is guiding you primarily. What is guiding you, you know, primarily is what you have to find out. You're almost coming to the end. We have about five or six minutes to go and a couple of questions. Uh, there's a question that has come from Girish again. What has been the most defining moments of your careers in each of your professional lives? So, Funny CJ, or defining? The most defining moment of your career. Yeah. CJ, you can go first and then Rini. No, no. Rini, please. After you. Oh, uh, for me, it was uh, 2016 when I was actually at New York. Uh, at the UN General Assembly and uh, did a conference for three days um, with the Secretary General and, and you know, the, the jazz that, that goes with, uh, with the United Nations. I think that was the defining moment for me because, um, you know, you, you, can, you can do your neighborhood school and you can do college and television and national events and all that, but you know, being at the United Nations with, with all the countries attending and listening to you, uh, I think there's nothing that beats that high. Thanks. Interesting. CJ, there's a question which I'm not going to ask. Just... Hello, hello. No, hello. no, get him, to, get him to answer his defining moment. Yeah, done, done. This is the problem when you get these non-communication experts, right? They just lose track. What is this? Amit, shame on you. And somebody wants to know what CJ full form is. I'll tell him it's Chetan Joshi or buy your book. Oh. Buy the book, yeah. Come on, you know the answer to this one. Uh, it's definitely not Chetan Joshi. Please. <laughs> Thanks a lot, dude. <laughs> no, I mean, not that it's much better anyway. Uh, <laughs> so from a, I, I, I'll answer mine from a defining moment's point of view. Uh, firstly, I would like to think that my best is yet to come. Uh, and uh, I will say this, that a lot of the big gigs... So I've, I've performed in Vegas. I've performed to a you know, full house at the Sydney Opera House. Uh, a big gig for me is for the ego of the performer. The joy of stand-up is to be in, be in an intimate room for me. But for me, my, I think the defining moments for me, so I do something called the Happiness Project, uh, where I keep trying to do different things that I believe will be able to uplift people who are going through a hard time. One of the initiatives that I did some time back was I said, anybody who's been unwell for a long time, I will come to their hospital room. I will come to their homes. I will perform just for them. So I've gone to a hospital, a hospital room and performed just for two people there. I've been to a hospital waiting room. One of the gigs I did uh, was in this lady's house, 80 plus. Uh, she has, has a leg amputated, goes for a dialysis three times a week. And there were just six of them in her bedroom. And when I finished that, that show, I told her, auntie, this, uh, this show is not for free as I had promised, but as payment every day, I need to receive a laughing photograph of yours. Three days later, her son sends me a message saying you have, you have increased her lifespan. He says, now when I send you her photograph, she wants to look at it first to make sure that she is looking nice. Oh. Oh. So, so for me, it is these shows that make the greatest difference. It's having an 86 year old woman come to you after a show and saying, thank you so much, Beta. I haven't laughed like this for 30 years. So I think those are the moments that matter more to me uh, than any of the big fancy ones. Nice, thanks. There's a question from Druti. I don't know if you want to take it or not, but Druti says, what's your best lockdown joke, Papa CJ? Do you have a best lockdown joke, CJ? Madam, free my joke nahi milega. Professional comedian. On point. Ke nile, paise ke yeah. karega. On point. <laughs> yeah, so and really the question to you is, have you made use of your voice when you were in a difficult or tricky situation? Did your voice come to your rescue during that situation of being difficult or tricky? I think my job demands that. Uh, my voice is usually, um, you know, the, the, the thing that rescues you in tricky situations. 
But yeah, having said that, uh, <clears throat> I remember one particular Air Force Day Parade. I was in school uh, at that, those years. Uh, and that particular year, we had a crash. I've never seen a crash. I'm, I'm an Air Force child, but I've never witnessed a crash uh, ever. And um, we were doing commentary and we had, you know, people up marching down uh, a particular section of the parade ground. And we had this young uh, pilot who had gone up on in, in, his, uh, uh, in his aircraft and he was doing the vertical Charlie. So the aircraft goes straight up and then does twirls and uh, then comes down. But we saw him climb up. And the, the sound of you know the aircraft going up at that point is so loud. So we're giving commentary saying that he's climbed up and then we're looking physically to see where he is. And suddenly we find that he has come down and crashed. And he crashes right in front of me, like ahead. Everything, everything just went silent. Everybody was just gobsmacked looking at the sight of a burning. I mean, you only, you only could see smoke and fire, nothing else. Um, and everybody is waiting. And I suddenly snapped out of it. Nobody had told me to be prepared for a situation like that. Nobody had told me what to say. Uh, I have never been in a crash, so I don't even know what, uh, what is the procedure that is followed. But I, the only thing I knew was that I had to get people off that ground. So I went on um, completely, you know, not, not understanding even what has to be done, but something mechanical just happens and you, you get into the, into the moment and you are there as a rescuer. So um, I got people out and moved out of the situation. Um, everybody was, uh, you know, the crowds were told to move away. Um, uh, said make way for the fire tenders. I didn't even know that there were fire tenders available. But anyway, I said it. Uh, I did all that, and you had you had um, you know uniformed officers available who had all frozen. So um, as a as a result of all that, I mean that presence of mind to be able to take charge uh, and guide people off, and we didn't have a single casualty. Um, uh, two years later. A chief of the air staff uh, gave me a commendation. Um, having, you know, having got something like that is when you realize that you are that same voice. So your role as a communicator is very important. You can change a situation from being, uh, you know, a, a fabulous uh, ceremony to becoming a riot in no time. So you have to ensure that the words that move out of your mouth are words that matter and uh, you're not irrelevant i would like to answer this question as well it's not as it's not as serious or impo as, as as important uh, an occasion but as regards where the voice has saved uh, i would i would like to state at the top that uh, i do not endorse drinking and driving but this is what happened uh, there were five comedians we finished a late night show at the comedy store in london drunk out of our skulls this is three o'clock in the morning get into a car one of the comedians drives the wrong way into a one way. The cops stop us, test the driver. He's way over the limit. Now, the law in the UK says you have to test, test the driver at the car and then again at the police station. And if you're above the limit, it's second to murder. It's a, it's a serious thing. So car gets put on the side. Comedian gets put in the cop van. We said, you know, moral support, we'll come along. So we get into the van with him. On the way to the police station, we start chatting with the cops. So it turns out that the cops are from Scotland. So, you know, we spoke to them about the Edinburgh Festival. We said, you know, it's a weeknight. We're encouraging the audience to have a drink. We're comedians. You've got to show them you're having a few yourself. To cut a long story short, we ended up performing for the police in Malibuan police station from four in the morning till six in the morning. They wow. got the driver something to eat. They let him go to the bathroom. They let him drink water. They checked him at 6.30 in the morning. He was below the limit. Sorry to trouble you, sir. That machine must have been faulty. You are free to go. Oh, wow. <laughs> Unfortunately, no, no a chief marshal gave us a commendation for that. But we... <laughs> <laughs> You can still drink and drive now. <laughs> well, Not... nowadays, with, nowadays with coronavirus, nobody's testing anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and there are a few audience questions, but we can't take them for the lack of time. 
uh, we've oh, difficult on, days Amit, last take week. them we should take, take questions them. why yeah, yeah take them yeah take them why can't we extend for... this okay we're here for the audience Amit. we're okay. not here for you let's, let's go 10 more minutes and i'll hold on to the last question the question Amit... is from <laughs> arpita ramani she wants to know how do you overcome creative stagnation i think this is for papa cj how do you overcome creative stagnation? How insulting is that? What do you mean? It's for Papa CJ. You think Rini's not creative? No, no. I'm she, a fossil. I'm a fossil. Excuse me. There are questions specifically long <laughs> <laughs> one for one for Rini from Rajneel next. But answer this, okay. CJ. Okay. Um, so here's the thing. I I don't think you can fight it, right? You have to learn to go with the flow. Exactly like I said earlier. There are some days. See, it's different for different people. You need to understand what your own rhythm is. Uh, there are people, there are comedians like Jerry Seinfeld who will just sit in front of his laptop every day for four hours and just write and something will come out. Uh, there are people like me who when I get an idea will make a note on my phone and then one day I will sit and just write like 45 minutes of stuff uh, and then go to an open mic and I try it out and see what works. So uh, there are two things I think you could do which I have found are really useful. One is called Morning Pages. So there's a book called The Artist's Way which talks about two things. Every morning when you wake up, write three pages. As you wake up, freehand, write three pages. Just like when you go to the loo in the morning to get the CRAP out of your body, you need to do the same thing for your mind. So this is a great way of getting some of that noise out so that your mind is open to take, taking things in. The second thing is something called an artist's date. Once a week, go on a date with yourself for two hours, nobody else. And do something that you would not normally do. I mean, go to a real museum. Uh, maybe, so in the lockdown, I learned what a sonnet was and tried to write a sonnet. Uh, cook a different dish. But try and stimulate one of your five senses, you know, in a way that it hasn't been stimulated before. Because that could lead to, to thought. So those are the two suggestions I would give. Thanks. The question to you, Rini, is from Rajneel Kamath, based in Bangalore. Would you like your voice to be used to power a digital assistant like the Amazon Echo or the Google Home? Uh, have, have they approached you? And if they have, if you say yes or no, that's the question from Rajneel Kamath. My God. I think you've got enough abuse in the, in the world. I don't want to be another CD. Uh, no, no. Not definitely. <laughs> for you from Vivan Mehra, he wants to know how do you deal with a hostile audience? CJ, for you. Hostile audience? What's that? I have no problem with a hostile audience, right? So the see, unlike music which can run in the background, for comedy people need to shut up and listen. Sometimes we are thrown into a corporate gig where people have come for an awards night or they've come to chat with their friends and they're being told shut up and listen to this guy. Those are harder gigs, but a hostile audience is still an audience that is paying attention to you, right? Now you have to remember, I started my first 700 gigs I did in the UK. I was working in rough clubs where you had football hooligans with skinheads and racists who were drunk and basically hadn't seen a brown guy before and thought they could pick on him and destroy him. I have dealt with that. So as far as, as an audience is concerned, there is no one solution right? You deal with them based on what they throw at you. Now, for starters, if it's a man who heckles me, I can destroy him instantly. If it's a woman, I cannot do that. It needs to get to a point where she is spoiling the gig for everybody else, right? That's when I have the right to put her down in a harsher way. But uh, this is the thing, right? You've got to deal with the hostility, you have to customize the way you deal with it depending on what people are throwing at you, right? And you have to remember the audience wants you to win. If they come to, if they pay to come to watch you perform and you do badly, it is their loss, right? So firstly, you've got to get this out of your mind that the audience is hostile. They're on your side. And accordingly, you deal with them is, is my opinion. I mean, I could give you a hundred examples of how one would deal with specific things, but we don't have the time for that now. The last audience question for Rini from Lalit Lobo. His question is, does the generation that never saw you reading the news on Gurudarshan come up to you and say, hey, ma'am, are you the voice on Delhi Metro? And how do you deal with that? Um, well, differently, because um, they, I mean, my voice is not just on the Delhi Metro, it's on all the metros. 
before we so, went there. Um, I do get to have audiences that have not seen me, who don't know me, um, but uh, that's fine. I, I mean, I don't have an issue with with any of that, uh, so long as they 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 you know are uh, respectful and and uh, polite. I think I think it's fine. Uh, unlike unlike CJ. Um, I think I would be unnerved if there was hostility, um, you know, in the audience or in, in whoever came up to me and and was rude. Um, that would be very difficult to handle. Thank you for that. I know there are people who say, "Hey, my parents named me after you, Rini, because I was born in the time you were reading the Russian news," and I'm sure you get a lot of that as well. Okay, so my last question as we wind up for this evening is what are the things, one or two things, CJ, you can go first and then Rini, that you feel the world can do, society can do for a better tomorrow, given what we are going through right now. What are the one or two things lacking or lacking in society that can be filled up by things we humans do to have a better tomorrow? I think one of the greatest things would be empathy. So for example, if you were doing a Zoom call and you had an audience that was interested in chatting for longer, had more questions, one of the things you could do for a better tomorrow was to not give them a time limit and say, sure, we'll stick around and answer your questions. Not that, you know, I'm wearing a jacket, I'm feeling hot, so I want to go. So we're going to kick Rini and CG off the call. So empathy, empathy, uh, Amit, very important for a better tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> well, I second, I second CJ, uh, empathy. And I think, uh, I think also thinking of the other. Um, it's a world, you know, the world that we live in is really... Uh, oriented towards the self. I think we need to get beyond the self and look at the other. Um, I think that is very important. And a lot of a lot of the situations that we are facing today is because we don't consider the other. Yeah, I mean, if, if they're beyond the self. Yeah, if there was one word I would I would want people to take away, that would be compassion. I think also kindness. I think we, we are we are inherently people becoming more mean and um, nasty for no reason. I think all of us can smile and all of us can be kinder to each other. Thanks, this has come up in the previous episodes as well. I'm glad you're saying that. Uh, thank you both. I know you would have loved to go on and on with answers to questions from audience, but I have this wooden jacket I've worn in summer at 40 degrees Delhi heat. I really need to get it off me. And take it have, off. We'll watch. You can, you can take dance. it off. I mean, CJ will help you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but thank you so much, both of you, for your time. Next Monday, for those watching in still, we have a very interesting corporate couple. They're a couple in real life too. Siddharth Banerjee and Aika Chaturvedi Banerjee, who wrote a book a few months ago called 52 Red Pills. The book is something like this. They are going to be on our show at 6 p.m. on the 29th of June. For those of you who can come back next Monday, welcome. Uh, thanks once again, Rini and CJ, for your Thank time. You, Amit. Interesting Man, insights. We, we were just getting warmed up, yeah. This is when the bits Thank were you, starting Amit, to get for juicier. suffering us. <laughs> <laughs> and, and thank you to the audience. Thank you to the audience for all those and, lovely and questions. Amit, thank Amit, thank you for being so gracious with us in spite of us uh, fooling around mm -hmm. with you. We, you know that we love you to bits and that you are yeah. awesome. <laughs> and I didn't give, a, give away your name uh, so that the people will buy your book. Okay. You're most kind. I know. <laughs> it's on page 145. Joshi? <laughs> people if, <laughs> go to page 145 and get his name. <laughs> but thank you both. We had, I'm sure, a great time and had fun. See you all soon. Somewhere Thanks, in guys. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Amit. Rini, I love Bye. you. Thank you. Me too. Me too. Love you both. Love you both. I love you as well, Amit. Bye, Roshan. <laughs> Roshan, thank Bye. you. Thanks, everyone. Bye, guys.